Uh, my name is Dr. Teddy Potter. I am clinical professor here at the School of Nursing, and I'm also honored to be the Director of Health, uh, of Planetary Health for the school. We acknowledge that the School of Nursing at the Twin Cities campus of the University of Minnesota is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. We recognize the long-standing relationship between the land and the Dakota people, and that is, they are the traditional stewards of this land. We also acknowledge the violence of colonialism and ongoing racism towards indigenous people. And I can tell I have old eyes here. <laughs> um, that we, we are growing in our realization that the healthcare system meant to protect and heal people has supported structures of racism and colonization, causing ongoing trauma and health inequities. By living here, working here and studying in this space and in this moment we now participate in this experience. It is our goal to make sure that we um, prepare health professionals who are working towards an equitable and a fair system for all. In part of my work as Planetary Health Director and my work with the Planetary Health Alliance, we've been working on an education uh, program for all people in all, across all disciplines, and that's called the Planetary Health Education Framework. That framework has five core domains. Um, the first is interconnection within nature. Everything's interconnected. You cannot um, uh, see or uh, consider that we're separated. What you do to um, the ecosystem uh, comes back and is done to us. The Anthropocene and health, we have to understand how humans are contributing to this problem. Equity and social justice. Every solution that we come up with has got to be grounded in principles of equity and social justice. Systems thinking and complexity. Yes, this is very complicated and complex, and we need to be understanding how systems work. And finally, movement building and social change, which brings us to today. You can understand the principles of planetary health. You can value the importance of it and why it's critical for the future. But if you don't understand how to move things forward and create policy and create um, uh, organizational um, uh, teams to, to work on these efforts, nothing gets done. So it is our great pleasure to host the 2023 Planetary Health Guest Lectureship, and that is Kelsey Wirth. Kelsey Wirth graduated from Harvard uh, um, and received her MBA from Stanford University. She's board chair and co-founder of Mothers Out Front. She served on the boards of the Environmental Working Group and Grist Magazine and currently serves as president of the Winslow Foundation. She's a native of both Colorado and Washington, D.C., and her most important job is being the mother of two young women nearly ready to launch into their adult years. Kelsey, we are so happy to have you. Welcome. Um, Teddy, thank you so much. And Dean Delaney and everyone else who's here today, thank you for being here. It's um, such a privilege to be here. I started the morning having breakfast just in the other room with a handful of students here and I'll tell you there is no better way to start the day than <laughs> talking to a group of students um, here at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. So thank you for that. That was really, really wonderful. Um, you know, in, in this extremely fraught moment in which we face an unprecedented set of challenges um, that would take a long time to name, it is a special privilege and honor to be here and with a group of people that is dedicating their lives really to taking care of others. So thank you for all of the work that you do in helping to create a better world. Um, this is a small group. I'm hoping we can move through a presentation. I can move through fairly quickly um, so we can get to some real discussion and conversation because that's really, I think, what we're all here for. Um, so, so I want to tell you the story today about how a group of moms came together to build a movement to respond to the climate crisis and help create a better world for their children. Uh, in the process, I hope to convey to you a sense of agency that you can play a meaningful role in addressing our planetary crisis, a sense of possibility of the change people like you can make when you come together, 
and an understanding of some of the basic building blocks of movement building and organizing. The story begins back when my older daughter Sophie was four years old and I was reading a book to her one evening that we just brought home from the New England Aquarium. I can hardly get through this today without my voice cracking. Sophie delighted in the magical pictures of the coral reefs with their amazing creatures and bright colors. But suddenly all I could think of was the article I had recently read saying that 99% of the world's coral reefs will die during her lifetime. I felt so sick to my stomach. I felt as if I was showing her magic in the world that will no longer exist when she's an adult. I was showing her beauty that was due to disappear in a breaking world. That night, my mind was a swirl of frightening images. All of you have seen plenty of images like this, droughts and extreme heat, flooding, famine, displaced people, and all the children who would suffer because of it. My sense of despair quickly turned to a sense of outrage as a mother whose number one job is to protect my daughter, Sophie and Lucy, that as a society, we are allowing this to happen. I felt powerless. I wasn't an elected official or a climate policy expert or a scientist or a nurse. In my mind, I was just a mom. But I also felt a huge amount of energy in that sense of outrage, and I thought that I couldn't possibly be the only mother out there who felt this way. And I wanted to figure out a way to connect with other moms. Around that time, I read an article that described the work of a man named Marshall Gans, who was a lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School, and how he influenced the field strategy of the 2008 Obama campaign by bringing community organizing practices to the forefront of that campaign. Specifically, this article described how the campaign invested in developing the leadership of thousands of people in communities all across this country so that they could organize their friends, neighbors, and fellow community members to help get Obama elected. In the end, using this organizing strategy, the campaign engaged 2.2 million volunteers. There's a great book about this called Groundbreakers by a friend of mine, political scientist Barry Hahn. I thought to myself, if you can get millions of people involved in electing a man to be president of the United States, why can't you get some large number of moms involved in working for climate justice? And so I called Marshall, who lives, who works at the Kennedy School around the corner from where I live coincidentally, and asked if he would meet with, with me, and thankfully uh, he agreed. In that first meeting, which lasted only about 30 minutes, Marshall talked to me about the role of social movements throughout history and explained that ordinary people joining forces to fight for what they believe in is the only thing that has ever driven transformational change in this country, from women's suffrage to civil rights, from laws that allow workers to unionize to abortion rights, same-sex marriage, and vital environmental protections. An organized movement of individuals can build the power to stand up to powerful vested interests and create a better world by successfully pushing for systemic change. And I'm sure it won't be lost on any of you. The picture in the right-hand corner of all the decision makers is a group of white men, all probably over the age of 60. Marshall also explained that there's a proven methodology to successful organizing that can be taught and learned. Hearing all of this from him, I suddenly felt as if the sun had come out from behind the clouds. And I wanted to get to work. It was clear to me that moms, if they could figure out a way to come together, could actually make a difference. I knew I needed someone else to work with in launching something, and so uh, I did so only after meeting Vanessa Rule, who'd been doing climate organizing in the state of Massachusetts for a long time. With Marshall's help, Vanessa and I saw that climate change, like most big, gnarly social problems, is a problem of political power. In spite of decades of scientific consensus, our having so many of the solutions at our fingertips, and most Americans wanting more action from our leaders, we have yet to make meaningful progress in addressing the problem. This is basically a failure of our democracy to be for or by the people. 
There's far too much concentrated power in the hands of the fossil fuel industry, which, as we know now, has spent billions of dollars over decades to stop meaningful action on climate with devastating impacts for people all across this country and around the world. And on the other side of the scale is concerned citizens and distressed moms and worried nurses and impacted communities. So how do we tip the scale? People need to come together to build power. Power as not a thing, but a dynamic relationship. Power does not cede power easily, and power has time on its side. You might experience a momentary blip that feels like the power has shifted, such as during a giant protest for March, like the Women's March after Trump was elected. But after this momentary demonstration of outrage, the status quo, which has the momentum on its side, returns. So to change the power dynamic, you have to be able to stand together again and again and persevere in the face of tremendous uncertainty. Take the example of the Montgomery bus boycott, which I think most children are taught in school is about a woman who decided one day to not move to the back of the bus. In fact, there was a lot of strategy leading up to that moment. And then the boycott itself went on for almost an entire year and involved thousands of people. So the question is, how do you build a group that makes the commitment to stand together over time? The key is, we know how. So Marshall Gans teaches an organizing framework at the Kennedy School, influenced by decades of successful organizing and movement building, that includes five central practices that we have adapted to Mothers Out Front in our organizing of moms. Relationships, creating a shared story of self, us, and now, structure, strategy, and action. The first is relationships. The commitment of people to stay together comes from building intentional relationships. We do this in organizing through one-on-one -on -one meetings, house parties, and more and more online interactions as well. People make commitments to the issue, and uh, not to the issue rather, but to one another. So relationships are really the lifeblood of movements. You show up time and again, not because of your commitment to the issue that you're working on, but rather because you've told John or Emily or Jane that you would show up. You need to actively and continually recruit new members as a way of building your power. So again, this goes back to relationship building. The second major component of movement building is creating a shared story of self, us, and now. Storytelling plays a central role in organizing. Through storytelling, we discover our shared values, which are what bind us together. Through storytelling, we answer key questions. Why am I here? What do I care about? We speak in the language of emotion. It's how we find connection with one another and then and the courage to embrace the challenge we are taking on. This connection through storytelling also builds community and solidarity in the sense that I am not alone. There's a way to tell stories, a strategic way to tell stories that engages people, brings them together, and motivates us to act. There are three components to that, story of self, us, and now. In the story of self, one person talks to another about the life experiences that taught me to care. Where do I get my values? Where do I get my sense of hope? What are my values? Then there's a story of us, which talks about the values we share. What is it that connects us as human beings? Why are we all here together? And the story of now is the urgency of now. Why coming together to act now is so important. And it is through the storytelling that we are able to imagine a different path forward and a better world. At Mothers Out Front, we use storytelling in every aspect of our work, from recruiting people to join our movement, to cel celebrating our successes, to pushing on decision makers to take action. When we go to a room and meet with decision makers, we always tell the story of why we are there and why Mothers Out Front. And every time, it shifts the energy and the dynamic in that room. 
The third principle is, or component, is strategy. Strategy and organizing is really about how we take the resources we have and turn those into what we need to achieve our goals. So some examples you might be familiar with throughout history um, are the use of grapes during the United Farm Workers Movement. So what, it, what are the resources the farm workers had? Not a lot of resources, but they had grapes and their labor that were connected to the grapes. And uh, another example, back to the Montgomery bus boycott, is the use of the bus fare during the Montgomery bus boycott. So strategy involves creating campaigns, which is how we break down massive, seemingly insurmountable problems into smaller pieces that your constituency can wrap its arms around and take action on. The next component is action. This is about making things happen on the ground. Good strategy has to translate into a series of actions that bring visibility to your movement and to your campaign that create allies and get the attention of decision makers that you're hoping to influence and ultimately enable you to win your campaign. Actions need to be counted so that you can measure your progress and impact and learn at every step along the way. And then finally, structure. So this is the part of organizing that happens more behind the scenes, and while it may sound a little less sexy than strategy and campaigns, it is actually what enables all of the work that follows. I love this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. because it's a quote that you never read by him, right? It's not one of his famous quotes that, you know, arc of justice bends, arc of history bends toward justice. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? Anyway, he says mass nonviolent demonstrations will not be enough. They must be supplemented by a continuing job of organization. To produce change, people must be organized to work together in units of power. Having a structure is what facilitates everything from bringing more people into your movement, enabling leadership development, strategizing in campaign development, and action. Structure ultimately is about the commitments that we are going to work together. It's how we make decisions, how we cooperate, how we communicate with one another. And it's very important not to fall into what Marshall refers to as the tyranny of structurelessness. Not having a clear structure with transparent decision-making roles and processes, as many of you I'm sure have experienced, will, uh, will means things are gonna happen without people understanding how or why they're happening. That could breed mis mistrust, harm relationships, and lead to all forms of dysfunction in an organization. So having a team structure with clear roles allows us to exercise our own leadership and develop the leadership of others. People can come into a team, become learners, then become leaders, and then become teachers. It involves continual growth and replenishing. Um, the way we think about teams at Mothers Out Front is one of distributed leadership. So one, no one person holds all the power. Responsibility is very much shared, and the team is interdependent with a sense of mutual accountability. There's also a very explicit commitment to leadership development. Everybody is responsible for identifying, recruiting, and developing leadership through training and coaching. Again, there are clearly defined, defined roles and responsibilities. And with this team structure of decentralized decision making, you have a capacity for exponential growth as you grow your movement. The idea is to create multiple teams coordinated around a central leadership team as a way of growing your movement. So at Mothers Out Front, we use geographically based teams because that tends to be where people want to organize and make a difference. And we start at the community level, and then we have a statewide leadership team in every state that we're organizing in, and then we have a national leadership team. All right, so that's a lot of, you know, sort of more theory. And the question is, how did we put all this into practice at Mothers Out Front? So we started with one-on-ones one -on -ones and house parties. Our first meeting that Vanessa and I had was six moms in my living room. That cold February evening, we took turns sharing our worries for our kids and our dreams for their futures. As we went around the circle, we heard our own despair, fears, and hopes reflected in each other's stories. We brainstormed what we might do next, next steps. And then each mom there agreed to host their own gathering to help grow our circle. It was the first time we felt that we were not alone anymore. Vanessa and I facilitated 23 house parties in the first three months that, that followed. They all had a 
similar format. First, we had an overview of climate change, basic science, its roots, causes, and its consequences. Then we broke into pairs so that people could share their stories and get to know one another, relationship building. And after that, we talked about what we might work on together. And then each person there filled out a commitment card indicating what they were willing to do next. The house parties, especially the early ones, could be very challenging. The moms tended to ask a lot of questions. This is about 10 years ago, so not everybody was experiencing climate impacts the way they are today. Climate change was impolite cocktail conversation. <laughs> um, so, so they would ask questions like, what makes you think moms can make a difference? Is there any evidence that this has worked before? Don't you have a plan? What's the plan? Moms are way too busy for this. I'm not political. I'm not an expert. There were a million reasons not to engage. But even when they were skeptical, they were open and really engaged in the conversation. My favorite house party actually was the first grandmother house party that I facilitated. As the women went around and talked about marching against the Vietnam War and for civil rights, I realized that I had a whole different sense of possibility than a lot of the moms of my generation. One of them proclaimed, I've got one more campaign left in me, and this one's for my grandchildren. And that's when I thought, oh, we really have something here that's going to work. So house parties start, suddenly started happening without Vanessa and my being there as other moms volunteered to facilitate. Things were starting to gain some momentum. Uh, soon we formed community-based teams. We knew we needed some kind of a structure to make it easy for moms to strategize about what they wanted to do together. They created campaigns to push their local governments to use only clean and renewable energy for their electricity. That's what they landed on for their first campaign. Moms, many of them for the first time, were meeting with their elected officials. They stood up and they spoke out at city council meetings, start, having started out by saying, I don't speak in public. Um, Oftentimes, with their children in tow, we had a few early victories in the towns of Cambridge, Somerville, and Lexington. And one year after our first house party, we launched our first statewide campaign with a big event in downtown Boston. That day, we set two goals. One was to get 15 towns and cities to commit to clean electricity, and two was to convince the governor to sign an executive order banning new fossil fuel infrastructure in the state. This was our first gathering. Moms organized rallies in front of the state house. A group of us eventually sat down with the governor. And while he never did sign that executive order, we were growing our power and getting more attention for the work that we were doing. One of our most notable early campaigns started when a group of moms learned from a Boston Globe story that there are thousands of dangerous gas leaks underneath our city streets that pollute our air, kill trees, and drive climate change. Using maps showing where all these gas leaks are located, they tagged, le they tagged leaks in cities and towns all across the state with bright, colorful markers making what had previously been invisible visible. Our moms even threw a birthday party for a 30-year-old gas leak. <laughs> complete with cake and balloons. This one was covered in the Boston Globe. Mm. On one frigid morning in Boston, more than 100 people of all ages came together. Some of them dressed up as gas leaks in giant fluorescent <laughs> blow up costumes. That day, our mom sent so many tweets to the president of our local gas utility that by the end of the day, she had agreed to meet with them. Soon after, our mom sat down with her the yellow arrow points to the president of National Grid, I will name it. Um, soon after, our mom sat down with her and other utility executives to develop a plan for fixing the largest leaks. We later learned during that period that at a gas industry conference, one of, our presenta one of the presentations featured a slide with a photograph of a Mother's Out Front website. The industry executive gave in the presentation warned the audience this is what we have to worry about. <laughs> our successes continued. This past summer, our moms joined with other key allies to pass a bold new statewide climate bill. And just in January, we were the first group to visit our newly elected governor of Massachusetts, Maura Healy, and her climate chief, who is the first statewide climate chief in the country, pulled me aside 
after this event and said, Mothers Out Front put these issues on the map for Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So our work has spread to California, Colorado, New York, uh, Virginia, and most recently Kansas City, Missouri, where moms are finding still more ways to push for change. Our moms have helped to stop the construction of gas power, power gas fired power plants. Uh, they've convinced city councils to require that new homes and buildings use only clean and renewable energy. They've secured more accurate air pollution monitoring in their neighborhoods. They've convinced school districts to switch from dirty diesel buses to clean electric school buses so that their kids don't have to breathe toxic diesel fumes. And the list goes on and on. By working on and winning campaigns, organized moms change our political landscape and our culture. People see what's possible and they are inspired to get involved. Today our movement is about 32,000 strong. We plan to nearly triple in size over the next three years. As our movement grows, we can win more campaigns that change policy and make people's lives better. But to be as powerful as we can be, we must create a movement where moms and other caregivers from all backgrounds feel that they belong, including and most especially those moms whose communities are most impacted by pollution from fossil fuels and will be hardest hit by our warming climate. When we first started, we had a vision of Mothers Out Front for organizing moms across race and class and geography, women from different backgrounds drawn together by our shared concerns for our children and our desire to create a better world for them. But we've learned during the last 10 years that turning this vision into a reality is a whole lot harder than we had imagined. And so we are right now at Mothers Out Front systematically rethinking everything about our work in order to put equity and justice in the center of all that we do. From how we work, to how we talk about what we do, to who we are, uh, sorry, to who we hire and where, and what campaigns we choose to work on so that we can become not just a broadly inclusive movement, but a truly unstoppable one. All right, so what does all this have to do with nurses? <laughs> um, when we started thinking about organizing moms, we asked ourselves, what are the unique attributes of moms? What makes us special as a constituency? And we put together a slide that we feel like you know, captures some of the unique, unique attributes of moms. Well, we're, there are 80 million of us or more. Um, we are everywhere. Everyone has a mom, turns out. Um, <laughs> I think we all know that mothers are multitasking superheroes. That's very helpful when you're organizing and movement building. We vote in incredibly high numbers. We have very important, strong purchasing power, so we get a lot of attention from, from private sector. Um, we have powerful social networks. I mean, moms are sort of the center, the centerpieces of communities by and large. And we are wired to protect. Doesn't mean we care about our children more than dads. Doesn't mean we're you know, superior in any way, but there is something um, we believe unique about moms. Um, and there's also the fact that mothers have been a force in past movements. We talked a little bit about this at, at dinner last night. Oftentimes the stories you hear about, are about the charismatic leaders um, whose names are written in the history books. And in fact, it turns out that women and moms have played a really central role in all of our social movements throughout history. So I'm not a nurse, but I decided to put together a slide for nurses that you all can add to. So why nurses? Why nurses? Well, how can nurses play a central role in driving transformational change to address our planetary health crisis? Well, you're four point, according to Google, 4.2 million strong, you can correct me. You are also everywhere, as it turns out, in every community across this country. Not enough of you, I know. Uh, you are the trust, most trusted professionals. You, you hear that a lot, but that, that is not something to simply brush out. That is an invaluable tool. I mean, that is an incredible asset that you have as just part of who you are. Um, you're trained to care for and to protect. You have a team community orientation, sort of a we orientation versus an I. I'm, it's not I'm going to fix this problem. It's we can fix this problem if we come together. Systems thinking, I think, characterizes my senses, a lot of the work that you do. 
Um, you are experts at triage, and I don't mean that in a medical setting, but triage. How do you prioritize what what you're facing a lot of different things? What what do you do first? What do you do second? What do you do third? Um, that is key to smart strategy. You have influence within a powerful industry. And uh, I mean, we can maybe during a discussion, you can help fill in the next bullet points on that list. Um, so, so I guess I'll end by, by acknowledging a little bit where I started, which is we live in a time of terrible, terrible realities. There is so much to fear, which can lead to a sense of despair, and a sense of powerlessness, but it is also a time of amazing possibilities. So we have to be able to imagine and to work toward a different future. We must ask ourselves the question, as the marine biologist and climate activist Ayanna Johnson does in the title of her new book, what if we get this right? Even allowing ourselves to ask that question requires hope. Not a kind of optimism that's about looking at everything through rose-colored glasses and ignoring the realities that we face. A famous Jewish philosopher defined hope as, quote, the belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. So how do we make the possible more plausible? I would like to suggest that we do it by coming together as informed citizens and as caregivers, as mothers, and as nurses, to reject the myth that we can continue on our current path and not just assert that our children and, and indeed all life on Earth deserve a livable climate, but work collectively to make it happen. We have learned at Mothers Out Front that there is joy in that coming together. When we come together, we're no longer alone. We feel new courage and possibility, camaraderie, and power. As nurses, you hold tremendous influence as the most trusted professionals in the US and around the world. People listen to you. And I encourage you to use that power not just to sound the alarm or to bring your planetary health lens to how you care for your patients, both of which are necessary, but to come together to build your collective power to help make change happen in your hospitals, in your communities, and beyond, because this is how we create a vibrant and equitable world for children everywhere. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, I think I was cheering right along with you. Um, having a grandchild, a granddaughter born less than two weeks ago, um, I do look in her face and I do look in her eyes and know that I have a deep responsibility to the future. Um, I look at our students and know that we have a deep responsibility to all of you, but a great hope when I hear what your interests are and where you're taking this. So it's about finding each other and connecting with each other and knowing that it is not hopeless. So thank you for opening this up and um, we'd like to have some questions. Yeah, please to be in dialogue. So yeah. are there some questions? And it doesn't have to be about planetary health. Today's talk is really about how do we launch movements to deal with all of these crises that we're facing and all of these challenges to health. Yeah, I have a question. And if you could say, if you're willing to say sure. your name. and yeah. Sure. My name is Carol Bagnoli, and I am I am not part of the nursing school, but I live um, on near the U of M campus in the, um, by the, in St. Paul. Um, and Kelsey was my college roommate. So I am think I mean, this is not my question, but I do thank the nursing school for inviting her. She's brilliant and, and has done so many incredible things around that. <laughs> more importantly, we have known each other for over 30 years, and she has only been to Minnesota once for my wedding, which was only a day. And so you inviting her has gotten her. We have, we're going to Paisley Park. She's going to see where I grew up. But it's a huge. But that's not my question. My question is actually... Um, so you started this with mom's perfect constituency for all the reasons you listed. There are probably lots of nurses in this room or n nurses in the Twin Cities who care about these things who are a great target who are not moms yet. Yeah. 
how, do you have people who participate and are active um, who are not necessarily moms? And are you, is the organization open to that? Just so everybody knows whether yeah, or yeah, not they can the, jump in now. The, the, I'm not sure we need while well, standing here anyway. Um, uh, Sorry to ask the first question. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, no, it's a great question, and and we use moms as kind of a um, kind of an umbrella term as sort of like caregivers, you know. So we are a women-led movement, um, and most of the women, probably most, are actually mothers. But but we define mothers as somebody who cares about the next generation. I mean, that's really how we define them. So it is a very broad definition. And um, we are very welcoming. We have lots of leaders at Mothers Out Front who are not um, technically mothers. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any dads? Yes. Are, we oh, have, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bob, we got, and then yeah. just a few more things just in the concert of getting the, the nursing people you know, excited and focused on this and involved. Can you say a few things about the the chapter here in Minnesota? We don't have a chapter in Minnesota. Oh, no, a huge opportunity. We don't have a chapter in Minnesota, but 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 I, you know, I want to be clear too that 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 you know today was really using Mothers Art Front as an example of organizing and movement building. So anybody who would like to start a Mothers Art Front chapter, you know. Minnesota, great. That's I'm not here to recruit for Mothers Out Front. Really, it's about you know it giving you a sense of possibility that if you want to come together with other nurses, other healthcare professionals, other community members, and make something happen, that anybody can do it, mm. yeah. and and that you are uniquely positioned to do that. Yeah. I was going to ask with the early stages you were saying how difficult it was to get even the house parties to be organized how did you communicate those initial like invitations to welcome people into these spaces um it was very informal i mean it started out extremely extremely informal where it was i mean vanessa had a network and i had a network that was mostly personal you know parents our kids went to school with i mean it was it, that's how it started really and it was um, hi, you know, would you like to come to probably an email, maybe a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations, too. Um, you know, we're bringing moms, to a group of moms together to talk about our climate change and our kids. I mean, it was really that simple. And people were really interested in it. It was like, it was like something like, oh, that sounds interesting. I mean, it was very unusual. That it was it was a unique thing in that moment. People were not talking about it. It was, and I, I really mean that. I mean, they, they, you weren't really supposed to talk about it. It was too scary, right? And people didn't really feel like it was they could. It was affecting their personal life. How does that relate to me? You know, and what can I do? I couldn't possibly do anything about that. So that's what we were sort of trying to have open that up, open up that sense of possibility. And not everybody who came got involved. We, I mean, we had, we had people who came to the house parties and left, and we never heard from them again. That's okay. You gotta just, you gotta do a lot of it to make, to really start engaging people, and then it starts to get, take on a momentum of its own. So it's sort of the. There were times when I would walk home from a house party and I would be practically in tears. I have to admit, might have been sleep deprivation, having young children at home, but it wasn't just that. I mean, it was, it is, you know, where the. the it, it sort of the sort of well what 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 are we actually going to do together and not having answers to all the questions and I felt like oh maybe this isn't going to work after all but then there'd be the next one and then there'd be you know some amazing people who were really energized and that would just enough to keep us going you should get up over some really humps yeah yes thank you again for the uh, voice of conscience in kind of stirring up our thinking about how we can, at the grassroots level, make a difference. You, oh. who you are. Oh, uh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm Vincent Peters. I am a director of community engagement um, here at the School of Nursing. And I'm very proud of our school for bringing planetary health to the forefront of every aspect. Yes, of, as you should of, be. Yeah. 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 And so I, I appreciate uh, your talk and all the ideas that you have shared and the success and the many miles that we need to go. 
one of the challenges, as I saw all the pictures that you have, our demography is changing, particularly in the United States. Uh, in the 10, 20 years, we are going to be really looking at a very vibrant, multicultural, multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, you name it, going to be. How do we get them engaged? Because when I work in the community setting, when I work with the immigrant community, particularly in the Twin Cities, they kind of look at me like, ah, it's a white liberal issue. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. just don't really yeah. see the connection to it. Yeah. And, uh, and I know when I talk about it, usually start with planetary health, is the day, place where you stand affects your health. Yeah. You don't have to do anything. You just stand there. It gets into your feet. It gets into your head. And then it passed on to your families and your offspring and everything. What, what strategies that we really have to, to bring them to the forefront? When I look at the images and pictures, uh, sadly no representation of that. So maybe it's, it's my eyes looking at it, but we really need to bring that. And I, one more comment that I really want to make is, yes, mothers look at the next generation, grandmothers look at next four generations, mm -hmm. and we want to bring grandmothers to the forefront as well. For sure. Well, well just... just <laughs> <laughs> um, on the grandmother front, I mean, I they make up a very large portion of our movement. Well, we say mothers are very... Yeah. Grandmothers are mothers, obviously. Last I checked, you have to become a mother. Before you um, so grandmothers are key. And interestingly, during the pandemic, they became even more important because our moms with young kids were trying to manage having their children learning from home and then trying to do their jobs from home. And then mothers out front just, you know, fell into the, into the background. Um, so, I mean, it's a very important question that you ask, and I, it, 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 is, it is through conversations, it's through listening, it's through um, ground truthing. Um, so, it's, 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 again, goes back to how we organize, who we organize, who we're hiring. So, if we have someone who looks like me go into a lot of communities and say, hey, come talk to us about climate change. I mean, that, you're not, that's a non-starter, right? But if you have somebody who is from that community um, or a community nearby who goes in and starts to listen and have conversations with people and understand what are, what are, they, what are they concerned about? Well, what are they seeing in their neighborhoods and their communities? It's not coming in. You don't start with, we never start with, you need to care about climate change because most people aren't necessarily connecting the dots. And yet, so many of their experiences, so many of their concerns actually do connect at some level back to what is happening with our climate and more broadly with the, the health of our planet. And so our job is to help make those connections. And so, I mean, I'll give you one example. When we started organizing for the first time in, in Virginia, we had an organizer, we had an organizer in Hampton Roads, which is the region of Virginia, well, it's on the coast. Um, it's also the second most vulnerable next to New Orleans place in the country to sea level rise. And so our organizer was talking to women, moms, in a housing project, public housing project, that was very vulnerable to sea level rise and was flooding constantly. In fact, it flooded so frequently that the children were losing in days of instruction at school even though the school was literally three blocks from where they lived because the kids couldn't safely get through the, f the flooded streets to, s to school. And so we didn't go in and say, hey, did you realize climate change is, you know, we talked, what are they concerned about? What's, what are the problems here? How can we help fix? And the first campaign was focused on getting a school bus that could pick them up and drive them to the school. Now, is that addressing our climate crisis? I mean, we're building relationships, we're building trust in the community, we're helping them understand, well, why is, why ultimately, why are the streets flooding so much? What is a role we can play? But, but if we're not addressing the immediate challenges facing these communities, then why would they want to be part of of the work that we're doing. So so it's so much about connecting their experiences 
by meeting them, meeting people where they are. And I feel like that's over this is a phrase that's overused, but that is really so much what is what it is about. So we don't go in thinking we know how to solve, we know what your problems are, and we know how to solve them. That's not where we start. We start and you know we start with by talking to people, one-on-one -on -one conversations, house parties, gatherings, that sort of thing. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'd like to use a local example just so people hear how this is done. University of Minnesota, um, one of our researchers here at the School of Nursing, Dr. Lauren Martin, has had a long-term relationship in North Minneapolis and over years has built trust on what are they concerned about, how do we do research in this area. So when one of their leaders of um, a large uh, African-American church up in North Minneapolis said, you know, I think this climate change and planetary health thing is going to be a problem. What do we do? Dr. Martin was able to say, I know Dr. Potter, who we can get you connected. So there were seeds being planted all along the way because of a relationship. We started working with them, and she said, it's not that we don't care, we don't know. People assume our community does not, um, in a way, doesn't matter, and they're not getting this information right. to our community. Right. And so we did presentations, we planned the with them, a whole a two-day event, planetary health event, um, and got information to the community. We had a celebration down on the Mississippi River. I had the Raptor Center come, and we had eagles <laughs> being shown to the kids, and connecting all these dots of this is your neighborhood, your environment, we need to protect it. They've made planetary health now as a, a core part of their church mission, and their vacation church school now teaches the kids about planetary health but they had been overlooked. It's not because they didn't want to know, they did not, um, weren't included. Right. So it is about planting seeds. That never would have happened if Dr. Martin hadn't had those deep relationships mm -hmm. to begin with. Right. Well, and, and, and another thing that's really important to note is that so much, so many of the ways that moms connect with the challenges around our climate crisis are around health. So. It is about the quality of the air. They're, well, why are they breathing dirty air? Was because we depend on fossil fuels. How is that related to climate change? Well, um, so so the health perspective is is absolute. The health lens, I should say, is key to, to everything we do. I, I I don't know that there's a single campaign that doesn't have a major focus on. So so here are the health challenges with this. Here are the health benefits if we, you know, if if we can address address this problem. And then the final thing I would say about that is that we have really, you know, back to all the different ways in, in which we are rethinking how we do our work, you know, we used to talk about addressing climate change or working, you know, working to address, yeah, basically we're a climate change organization and now we talk about being a climate justice organization because it's about what we're working not just against, which is yes, we're working against climate change, nobody wants that, we're working for climate justice, right? And then that opens up this sort of, that sense of, well, where are we headed? And how can we imagine this future together? And, it, and it's working for something positive and it's addressing the core needs um, of the communities that you're referring to. Yeah. Questions? Comments? Yeah. Hi, my name is Stephanie Gingrich, and I am a clinical assistant professor here in the School of Nursing. Um, and my question is about your global impact. So a lot of the work that you've described is, is so meaningful and sounds like it's based a lot within the United States. Yeah. Is there an effort at this point with the organization to work on um, initiatives internationally or collaborating with groups that are also international? Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, we have, we, Mothers Out Front was, was given an award, by a UN-related award, and I can't remember the name of the, the UN, so complicated, but, um, and we, <laughs> to say, anyway, that we were, um, had the opportunity, Vanessa and one of our um, mom leaders uh, had the opportunity to go to the COP um, in Madrid. Um, where they were able to connect with a bunch of groups from around the world. Um, and we are part of an umbrella group in, I don't know, 
that, that is in a, a group of um, parent-related climate organizations from around the world. Um, so there's been a little bit of effort on that, and I would say it's been, it's been very limited so far, uh, in part because we've just had our hands full you know, on the work that we're doing here in the U.S. Um, and I, it would be fun to do more, that, helpful and important, I think, to do more of that going, going forward. Um, interestingly, there was a, I had an experience with a, a mom in London who um, wanted to start a U.K. moms for, I can't remember what she was calling it, um, and I was talking to her for a while, and she got something going in, in the UK focused on moms and and climate. I haven't spoken. You're making making me remember. I realized I haven't spoken to her recently, but so so there are there are lots of things happening. I mean, I think again, so much of the work happening globally is being led by women and by moms. They just don't talk about you know them being a moms organization. So um, I think that has to be said too. Hi, um, Erica Zipkowitz, and also a clinical assistant professor here. Most importantly, my, my best job is I, I am a mom of six um, amazing kids. I hope everyone thinks that of their kids, seven to 22. So, wow. you know, the oldest civil engineer um, looking at, um, uh, you know, building spaces that mm -hmm. are, are net positive or carbon positive and, and, you know, and the youngest one, you know, thinking about the polar bears and concerned about what's going on in Alaska and um, Native Americans and all, all of these things. So, you know, the great diversity in that. But being here at the school, you know, we have great opportunities to work with international organizations and being involved um, in chairing national meetings. And, and then I go to those meetings and I meet my neighbors. Mm -hmm. that are working at, you know, the latest person was uh, that I met last year is really involved in the Three River Park District and how we can work together. So we go to, you know, we're kind of on this big umbrella where we're doing this national, international work, but then in our own communities, we don't necessarily know who's next door. Right. And, and also, you know, the, the, the work of a mom, you know, people still know that I'm a researcher and I, getting these grants and doing this work and multitasking is my favorite thing, but they don't connect with that necessarily where I just want to be a mom. Yeah. And I want to talk, you know, to my seven year old about her concerns about the planet. But when I'm in meetings, you know, I, I you know, like, oh, you're, you're here. You were in this organization or a podcast with this or, so there's like maybe a disconnect in that. How do you, you know, this movement was kind of a, is like a, a grassroots bottom up movement. How do you, Bridge the gap from the top down and the bottom up, to me, in a meaningful way that that is inclusive. Um, there are a lot of things in that question. Let's say um, <laughs> so it wakes me up in the morning. And how does this work? Well, it, interestingly, I'll just share this that uh, Vanessa, who'd been doing climate organizing in Massachusetts for seven years or something, had never brought her mom identity into that work. She left it at the door, mm -hmm. just like this is, for whatever set of reasons, and, and, and it took, after I sat and talked to her about this, and two weeks later she'd quit her other job and wanted to do this, but she's like, I, you know, I've, I've never brought these worlds together, you know, so that's sort of, I was fascinated by that, and, you know, again, back to the storytelling, when we have meetings with people who are not necessarily part of Mothers Out Front, uh, you know, elected officials, etc. When we tell our stories, it forces them to tell their stories too, it, which humanizes. It, it just shifts things. So one of our moms talks about meeting with the president of Eversource, which is one of our main utilities in Massachusetts, CEO, and he came into the meeting and he had been asked by his staff coming to the meeting if, if he thought he needed security <laughs> because he was meeting with climate activists, <laughs> which was totally kind of amazing. But he sits down, and our, we have two moms in there who sit down with him, and our first mom, Zainab, starts, <coughs> bless you. Um, 
talks about why she's there. Oh, I have I have three children, and it's, you know, tells her story, and and it goes to him, and he says, um, "Well, I'm CEO of EverSource, and I have three children too." And it you could see like his thing, his brain shifting, you know. So that's not an answer to your question, but I do think that that. People seem to be so afraid, especially maybe this is unique to the, I don't know, about bringing their personal values into the work that they do. E- even if those are what are driving them, they don't talk about it, right? And it, I think that's a missed opportunity. Not that you want to always be talking about that. Obviously, you have to just get stuff done sometimes. But um, I think it is a missed opportunity because there's so much power in that. Um, in terms of, like, bottom-up, top-down, I mean... There's always inherent tension in any movement building organization between bottom up and top down because you have to be able to make decisions. You have to be able to move in reaction to opportunities that come up. And so, you know, who's making those decisions? And um, you have to have clear decision making, you know, structure, processes, et cetera. Sometimes those are not perfect. Oftentimes they're not perfect. And people can get their feathers ruffled at a community team level when suddenly they hear that Mothers Out Front has signed on to something statewide or something like that that they weren't aware of, they weren't asked for their opinion on. And then we have to explain, like, there, yes, we are bottom-up, we are also sometimes top-down, like, like, and, and there's just an inherent tension in that. And, and that's not, we can't make it go away. We can do our best to address it, we can, we can talk about it, but uh, there will be times when it's not going to feel totally grassrootsy, you know, it's just just the nature of it. So 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 there's that too. And in terms of and I'm not even sure I'm answering your question, so I want to come back to you, but we we have, you know, because moms are literally everywhere, we have moms involved who are in, you know, positions of power and positions of authority. And we use that. And you know, and and thinking about the original vision for mothers out front where I thought, well this is with moms we can cross so many lines of difference. We can organize moms from all backgrounds. Because if you get a bunch of moms in a room together from all different backgrounds, they will always find one thing in common, one thing to talk about, and that is their concerns for their children and their hopes and their dreams for their children. And I thought, what an opportunity. We can just all come together around that, <laughs> you know, without the intentionality needed to make all that happen, which was a you know, which was a which was a failure, really, an early failure on Mother's Out Front's part. Um, But there is something amazing that happens when you have moms who are in directly impacted communities who have the life experience to talk about what what they are what they are experiencing and and to understand what the solutions might look like. And you bring moms like that together with a mom who happens to be, you know related to somebody who could call up the governor if need be or your local legislator or whatever and when you bring you know everybody has a source of power they bring to the table we want to make use of all of it and bring it together and that's how we are maximally powerful so if we can bridge those differences and bring these moms together people together from all these different backgrounds and figure out how to tap into all their different unique you know sources of power that they bring to the table then we then we really have something powerful. But I don't know if that answers your question, so maybe we can talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, so similar. Oh, I'm, I'm Melissa. I'm a DNP student or in the School of Nursing. I want to applaud you for looking at lo- how to be involved with local politics. I think as a nurse who's a systems thinker, I think back to high school civics and what you're taught about as a citizen and how to engage in politics as a citizen. It's national elections, the executive branch has the power, make sure when you're told to vote, it's to vote in a presidential election every four years. And the old say, I mean, all politics is local. So I love that you're embracing getting involved in, I'm very active in local politics, and I just think I applaud you for getting involved in local politics. Because I think there is there's a gap um, at, that exists as citizens. We're not we're not taught how important that is. And as someone who is not technically a mom but a godmother, mm-hmm. I am well known um, with the Minneapolis school board. <laughs> um, Great. 
But, and people will ask me, well, why, why are you contacting the school board? Well, because I'm concerned with the future of these children. Yeah. And also, that's my tax money. And I should have a say in how that tax money is used. Right. So I think it's just, like you're doing, shifting, shifting the narrative there and encouraging people to see how important local politics yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, at some very fundamental level, we are about civic engagement. Yeah, yes. And, and people who, the moms who, and others who get involved learn so much about how things work. <laughs> people don't know how things work. And, they, yeah. and it's like, well, okay, so I'm really worried about X problem. Why well, didn't real, like, who does that even in my town or my city? Nobody knows. And, and that's the starting point, right, of understanding. And that's where the... That's where the strategy and the campaign development comes in, right? You identify something that you want to work on. Like, well, who are the decision makers or who should our targets be, right? And yeah. moving something forward. The, the other piece that I think is really, you know, that your comment makes me think about the sort of getting involved locally, which of, you know, where all of our work begins, um, is it's and, and the relationship piece is you you hear constantly of about the crisis of loneliness that we face in this country and the isolation. So you're not knowing that your neighbor does X until you show up at a business meeting and you're like, oh, but we live next door to each other. How come we've never talked, right? I mean, this is which is not a criticism of you and how you live your life in your neighborhood. That is the case with almost all Americans, and it it was a it was really it's just been extraordinary to see what gets built when these when people start coming together to, at, at the community level to work on problems together. And people who've done that kind of work in the past, you'd be like, yeah, duh, that's how things happen. But most Americans are not functioning that way. And it's, it's really, it is sort of a beautiful thing to see that happening and to see that coming together. That piece and the leadership development, watching moms come in and say, yeah, I'm never going to speak to anyone. You know, next thing you know, you know, six months later, they're the ones testifying at a hearing, and you think that, to me, that is like, the, that's the most gratifying part of, aspect of the work that we do. Well, speaking of relationships, I think we're going to end the Q&A here, so you can all be engaged with each other at the tables and be in dialogue with one another, meet each other, and, um, and, and look at uh, challenges and how we might work on these challenges. Kelsey, we are so grateful that you are here today, Thank that you, you came all the way out to Minnesota. Um, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>